doctors used to be the most sainted profession in America. And uh, today we have a, a, a president who throws shade on, on the medical, on scientists in the medical profession. Was there a tipping point where um, doctors started to be, I don't know if corrupts the right word, but uh, was the pharmaceutical industry uh, one of the genesis of doctors uh, becoming more unethical? Uh, the, I think it's a question of certainly be, the pharmaceutical industry is the reason, the direct cause of why doctors have overprescribed drugs over a period of time. Since the 1950s, they overprescribed antibiotics right and left. They were encouraged to do so. The more antibiotic prescriptions you wrote for a given brand name for a company, you want a trip down to Bermuda and you could talk to other doctors. You became part of their, their speaking bureau. You were able to get money, all types of gifts. As a result, they'd write those scripts as fast as possible. You say, what's the downside? The downside is it creates antibiotic resistance. And so it opens up the, I start the book with a thing called Patient Zero, the first patient ever in Reno, Nevada in 2016 who dies of what should be a simple bacterial infection that should kill no one, but there's not a single antibiotic in existence that can stop it. That's the fear in the future from what that created. In the 60s, what happens? Doctors overprescribe diet pills. They prescribe Adderall too high. They prescribe amphetamines and speed and black beauties. Diet clinics open up. They're making monies. They become pill pushers in some ways. And the same thing happens with what I call the mild tranquilizers. That's Arthur Sackler's brainchild. That's Valium. It's Librium. Valium becomes the number one drug in America for 15 years. And you want to know how doctors end up prescribing it? At a time when 95% of the doctors in the 60s were men, Arthur Sackler came up with an ad campaign for Hoffman LaRoche that he ran a series of ads based upon monkey experiments that had been done at, at Walter Reed by the US Army in which they strapped two monkeys into a machine, only their arms were free, and then they put electrodes on their feet and they would deliver electric zaps to their feet. Next to one of the monkeys, they put a lever, and if that monkey operated the lever, it would stop the electricity to both of them. Monkeys are pretty smart, so it didn't take long for the one monkey to operate the lever and stop the zaps as much as possible. When those monkeys died and they redid this experiment, Ray, dozens of times, they would do autopsies. The monkey operating the lever, what Sackler and others called the so-called executive monkey, because it had to make the executive decision of operating the lever, it had cirrhosis, the equivalent of calcium calcification in the arteries, it had ulcers, it had all types of damage from stress to the organs. The other monkey, the non-executive monkey, didn't have that at all. So Sackler said, ah, that's how we advertise Valium and all the benzodiazepines and the mild tranquilizers. We say the executive monkey, that's men. They have to earn the, the, the living for the entire household. They have to look strong for the world. They go out and when they're under stress, they get ulcers. So we give them Valium and the benzos so that they can be better at business. Women, on the other hand, they're hysterical and neurotic. We give them benzos so that they can be better at being housewives and not really interrupting men too much. Now, that sounds like the most sexist, ridiculous thing you could imagine, yet it was bought by American doctors. Not only did Valium, was it prescribed by general practitioners as opposed to psychiatrists, the first drug to break that, not only was it the number one selling drug in the country, but nearly 75% of the prescriptions were written for women in the most stereotypical ads. And when you look back on it, you think to yourself, as you said, doctors are supposed to be the, the, the people we trust. They're the ones we put our faith into. When you see how easily they are manipulated by the advertisements, the pitches, and the efforts from pharma companies, it is very frightening at times. In the 1960s, the right about this in the book, uh, and uh, Trish had written about it in an earlier book called No Hormones, No Fear in 2003. Uh, there was a book put out called Feminine Forever, Robert Wilson. He was a gynecologist in New York. The book was a massive bestseller. And it argued that there was a new wonder drug, hormone replacement therapy. The, um, and if you were able to take that from Wyeth as a woman, you would essentially beat back the time clock. Your hair would never dry, you wouldn't get wrinkles, you'd keep your sexual vigor. You'd never turn into what Wilson described as a eunuch, which is what he said his mother had become. And that book helped make hormone replacement therapy one of the biggest drugs of the 60s. You know what happened? It turns out that Wyeth hid the reports coming in 
of adverse side effects that included blood clots and cancer. That didn't come out for 15 years when tens of thousands of women had already been affected and died. And it later turned out that Wyeth had subsidized Wilson, helped to pay for the book, put him into his own office. His own wife got breast cancer from using it. That was hidden from the public. So when you look at this, you say, doctors, they're the ones who guard our safety. They're the ones who should know better. There are all too many stories here, unfortunately, where many of them are good. They watch out for our better. We have doctors that we put our trust into that we go to as our general practitioners and others. But there are plenty of examples here of doctors who betray that Hippocratic Oath and who get in it for the greed. And pharma companies, when they find the ones who want to get in for the money, they're very good at pushing the right buttons.